AI has been taking up all our attention lately. But we shouldn't forget about the metaverse vision that Meta presented a year ago. A vision of transporting humans into a 3D space. Today, I prepared something special for you. Not only will we dive into the metaverse, but we'll also fuse it with the power of artificial intelligence. Consider this jewelry website that allows you to customize and create the ring you want. By customizing your own 3D diamond color, as well as the ring color and the entire look and feel of the ring. Likewise, Car Visualizer allows you to look at different, incredibly detailed car models and change their color as well. Finally, the showroom application allows you to customize your own living room in 3D. You can move around to get a feel for the space and then click on elements to customize their color and material. For example, for this table, we can choose from two different types of wood, as well as granite and metal. We can also customize other elements such as this great lamp on top. And as you can see, you can see the changes and reflections in real time. These web applications are incredibly impressive and have practical applications for product showcase. Several large companies have already incorporated impressive 3D features into their products, such as GitHub, where we can see these commits move around the globe in real time. Vercel with their version of the globe, where you can move it around and see where the websites are deployed. And Amazon with their 3D product view. That's precisely what we'll do in this video. You'll learn to create your own 3D product-based website in React using 3JS. By the end of this video, you will have built and deployed a product-based t-shirt website that is so impressive, it is guaranteed to give you a job. And you might be shocked at how easy it really is once you understand a few concepts related to cameras, lighting, and geometry. This tutorial is beginner friendly and I'll assume you're completely new to 3JS. Inspired by Anderson Mancini's idea, we have expanded this project with additional features, complementing his exceptional work as one of the best creators in 3JS. Recently, Anderson launched a new course centered on this very topic, where he will teach everything from creating these models to building the application. So if you want to learn Blender and create impressive 3D models, we encourage you to check it out. The link is in the description. While the concepts and basic functionality might be the same, we enhance the project by allowing users to choose different colors, upload any file they desire, and even leverage AI to generate unique image logo for their model. So please allow me to give you a quick demo of this fantastic application you will build today in the next two hours by following this course. First, you'll create a homepage where you will tell your users what the site is all about. Then, upon clicking the Customize button, your shirt will move and animate to the center of the screen. You'll be able to change its color, as well as upload your own logo or texture, or even better, write a customized prompt to ask AI to generate the logo or the texture for you. Once you have both the logo and the texture, you can toggle them on or off. And once you're happy with the shirt, you can even download it. Isn't that crazy? Overall, in this video, you'll learn 3JS, a powerful 3D graphics library for rendering and animating 3D models. React 3 Fiber, a popular library for creating 3D graphics with 3JS in React. Tailwind CSS, a popular utility-first CSS styling framework. Framer Motion, the most popular library used to bring your React websites to life with animations. You'll also learn how to load, create, and customize stunning 3D models and geometries with various lights, as well as understand the 3D world with the camera and positioning of an object in the space. You'll learn how to add custom color and file support, generate and use images through DALI AI, download the resulting t-shirt model image, ensure responsiveness across all devices and improve your site's performance, and you'll learn how to write clean code and maintain a proper code architecture. We're going to start simple 
and then move to more complex concepts. I'll explain every step of the way. If this video reaches 20,000 likes, I'm recording the next 3JS video. Alongside this video, I've also prepared a comprehensive 3JS cheat sheet that you can use for reference in all of your future 3JS projects. The link to download the resource entirely for free is in the description. Now, let's begin. Before we start building out our project, let's first get the hosting and the domain name for our new website, your portfolio, or any site you'll create in the future. Hostinger is my personal recommendation. And right now, they're offering a crazy deal, so I simply needed to show this to you. The link to the website you're seeing right now on the screen with an extra discount in it is in the description. Let's visit it and click the Claim Deal button to see if it's really as good as it sounds. We are getting premium web hosting. For about three bucks a month, you can host 100 websites. You also receive 100 gigabytes of SSD storage, unlimited free SSL certificate, which means that you get HTTPS security, and most importantly, you get a free email, but on top of that, you get a free domain name. Hostinger has a great price to quality ratio, high speed servers, 24 seven chat support, and most importantly, developers love using it. As you can see by these exceptional ratings on third party platforms, we're going to create an entire 3D product website. So we want to have a custom domain name to be credible. For every industry standard application, such as the one you're building in this video, we need it to be fast, reliable, and trustworthy. And all of the features you're getting with this plan, such as a custom domain name, email, and speed, makes all the difference. Since I've partnered with Hostinger, they decided to give you an even bigger discount. You can find the link and a unique discount code in the description. Once you visit the link in the description, click Claim Deal, and then Add to Cart. Here, we can choose the period of our hosting. In this case, I'm gonna choose 48 months, since that's going to allow me to save the most money and get free three months. After that, you can scroll down and select your payment method, but more importantly, you can add a special JavaScript mastery coupon code that's going to allow you to get an even bigger discount. After you complete the purchase, you'll be redirected to the Hostinger's dashboard. I'll see you there. As you can see, I'm personally using Hostinger for all of my company's websites. If you purchased premium hosting, then you should be able to see this yellow setup button here, and then also the claim domain button to get your free domain. Let's go ahead and immediately set up our premium web hosting so that after that, we can focus only on development. You can click start now, skip, we're gonna create our own website, claim a free domain. You can do this at the end of the video too, in case you wanna spend some time thinking about the proper domain name. In this case, I'm gonna do 3JS products. That domain is available and it's quite a good one. So let's go ahead and continue. And our domain is being registered. There we go, it's done. Click control panel and there we go. Everything is set up. Now what's left to do is to build this phenomenal 3JS AI powered application. And then we're gonna deploy to the internet at the end of this video using the file manager. Let's get started. As we always do on the JavaScript Mastery YouTube channel, we're gonna start from bare beginnings by creating a new empty folder on our desktop called 3JS. Once you have it, you can drag and drop it to your empty Visual Studio Code window. Visual Studio Code is the most popular editor for a reason. It has a lot of great extensions, source control, but it also has a terminal that you can visit if you go to view and then terminal. It's integrated right here within our editor. And we can use it to spin up our React application using a tool called Vite. The only thing you need to create your React application is run the command npm create Vite add latest dash dash space dash dash template react and then say client. This is going to create a new React application inside of the client folder as it did in just a couple of seconds. Before we go ahead and explore the file and folder structure, 
let's first install the packages that we need for our frontend. Of course, we're gonna install them inside of the client repository. So first we need to CD into client. Again, make sure that it says 3JS client here. Great. So the packages that we're gonna need are gonna be npm install. First, we need three, which is the 3D 3JS library. Then we're gonna need add react dash three forward slash fiber. And this is a react renderer for the 3JS library. We also need add react dash three forward slash dre. And this contains useful add-ons for React 3 Fiber. Then we're gonna need M-A-A-T-H or math. And this is gonna be used for useful math helpers and mostly math that's meant to be used with 3JS. Then we're gonna use a package called Voltio. And it is a new package that allows us to really easily manage React state. No worries, it requires absolutely no learning process. You're just gonna immediately get to know how to use it. We also need a react-color package, which is a color picker. And finally, framer-motion, which we're gonna use for some cool animations. Let's press enter to install these packages. This process is going to take just about a minute, so feel free to pause this video and I'll see you right back. There we go, once the packages have been installed, we can also set up Tailwind. Tailwind is a utility-first CSS framework packed with utility classes. It's going to allow us to write classes in a quicker and a more efficient way. So let's try to search for Vite to see if they have a starter guide. There we go, install Tailwind CSS with Vite. We have already set up the project, now we have to install Tailwind CSS, which we can do by running the first command, npm install dash d, Tailwind CSS, post CSS, and auto prefixer. After that command, we can also initialize Tailwind by running the mpx Tailwind CSS init p. As you can see, this is going to create a couple of files right here, such as post CSS config and the Tailwind config. Next, we need to copy the template paths. So copy this, go to tailwind.config.js and paste it right here. Finally, we also need to add our Tailwind CSS directives to our CSS, which we can do by going to source and then index.css and then adding them right here at the top. Great, Tailwind should now be properly set up. Now let's discuss the file and folder structure of our new client application. First, we have the public folder that currently contains only a Vite SVG. Soon enough, we're gonna add our awesome short 3D model here. Inside of the source, we have some assets which we don't need, the app CSS, the app JS, main, and so on. For now, we can get started by running the application and seeing how it looks like in the browser. We can do that by opening the terminal and running the npm run dev command. In a couple of seconds, it's going to spin up a version locally. You can hold control and then click this link. And there we go, the application is now running. Now we're gonna do some modifications to our structure, just so we can focus on what matters most, and that is learning 3JS and creating a great application. So for that reason, down in the description, I have already prepared a couple of files and folders for you. Don't worry, they're not gonna contain any logic. You're going to focus on all of the most important logic on your own today while watching this video, but these are just going to be some assets and styles that are gonna speed up the boring parts of this video so we can focus on what really matters, and that is mastering 3JS. So with that said, down in the description, you'll be able to find a zipped public folder, which you can download and unzip. You can then delete this public folder right here, and drag and drop the updated public folder right into the client. It should contain the React PNG, 3JS logo, as well as this special shirt baked file. There's going to be one more zipped file, which is the assets folder. So again, you can delete the current assets folder and then drag and drop the updated one. There we go. It's going to contain some AI icons, download icon, and so on. We won't be needing this app.css, so you can delete that, but we will need our styling. So down in the description, this time inside of a GitHub gist, you'll be able to find a complete index.css file, 
which you can simply paste over here. It contains about 90 lines of code, but again, it's just CSS and mostly just some styles which we'll be reusing across the application. All of the files that matter, you're gonna write by hand using Tailwind on your own. So once again, no worries there. And finally, there is just one more folder that we need to bring in here. And that's going to be the config folder. So simply feel free to copy it, unzip it, and then paste it right here within the source folder. Keep in mind, public folder is within the client folder, and then the assets and the config are within the source. So if we expand the config folder, you can see that in here we have the config.js containing the place where we can put the links for our backend. We have some constants, which we're gonna use simply to loop over and to show different tabs. We have some helper functions, and don't worry, this isn't any really complicated logic. This was actually created by ChatGPT while creating this application. So I'm gonna show you how we can get that as well. And finally, we have some motion, frame or motion utility functions, which we'll be able to use right within our application. With that said, we now have everything we need to start the development of our great application. Inside of the main, we're creating the app, and then inside of the app, we currently have the boilerplate that was created for us by Vite. But for now, we can remove most of that stuff and simply keep the app that's going to return something like a div within which we're gonna have an h1 that's going to have a class name equal to head-text. If we save this, go to view, and then terminal, it was already running from before. So if you open up your React application, you should be able to see a huge React text right here. And that's because we applied this head text property by Tailwind. So that means that it is working as well. With that said, we have our app, we have our main, and we are ready to start developing our great application. Hopefully you're excited. You managed to go through this setup part so from now on, it's going to be much more interesting and we're gonna dive into 3.js in no time. Now, to be able to see the changes that we make live in the browser, let's put our editor and the browser side by side. There we go. Now we can actually see what we're doing. Let's change this to 3.js as that's what we're focusing on today. Now we can immediately start by creating the file and folder structure of our great 3.js application. We have already created the assets folder and the config folder, but we're gonna also have the components folder and the pages folder. Inside of the pages, we're gonna create two different pages. The first one is going to be the home.jsx. This is going to be our main page. Inside of there, you can run RAFCE. This is going to create a new React arrow function component. And if what I've just done seemed like magic to you, you most likely don't have the ES7 plus React React Native Snippets extension installed. So simply search for it and install that extension and try to run that command again. Great, so now we have the home page as well. Let's repeat the process for creating the second page, which is going to be the customizer.jsx page. And we can repeat the process there as well. These are the only two pages we'll have. The entirety of the app's functionalities is going to be contained within those two pages. There is something else we're gonna have as well, and that's going to be the canvas folder. Inside of the canvas folder, we're gonna have a couple of files and folders. First, we're gonna have the canvas itself, which is going to be under index.jsx. So there, we can also run RAFCE and that's gonna create a new function. We can rename it to canvas and canvas here as well. Great. So now we have these three pages, which we can import inside of app.jsx. So inside of there, let's import the canvas coming from dot slash canvas. And let's also import the customizer coming from dot slash pages forward slash customizer. And let's also import the home coming from that slash pages forward slash home. Great. 
and now we can utilize them within our application. So that's going to be, instead of div, we can use the HTML5 semantic main tag, and we can give it a class name equal to app and transition dash all and ease dash in. This is gonna be useful later on once we implement transitions. Within there, we can render the homepage. We can also render the canvas. And finally, we can render the customizer. Now, if we save that, you can see our three great pages. Well, in this case, they're all on the same page, but you're gonna see how we're gonna make them all come together really soon. So of course, let's get started with the homepage. We can do that by closing the app and going within the pages home.jsx. Inside of here, we're gonna import a couple of things. Let's first import something known as a motion coming from framer-motion. We're gonna use this to apply some animations later on. From there, we're gonna also need something called animate presence. This is a component that enables the animation of components that have been removed from the tree. Next, we can import something known as a use snapshot from this great new React State Library called Volsio. Yep, it's pronounced Volsio, but Voltio is fine as well. Um, you're gonna see really soon how easy it is to use it, so no worries there at all. And finally, to make our framer motion animations work, we can import a couple of things coming from dot dot slash config forward slash motion. And the things that we need are gonna be head container animation, also head content animation, also head text animation, and finally slide animation. We're getting all of these up front, so it's easier to utilize them within the code later on. But if you're wondering how the code for these looks like, you can see it's just gonna slide in specific pieces of content by a specific number of pixels. Now, before we actually start creating the JSX for our homepage, let me quickly explain how Volshio works because it's so simple to use. For it to work, we need to create a new folder right here in a source folder called store. And then inside of there, you can create a new index.js file. There, you can import something known as a proxy coming from Volsio. And then we simply need to initialize the state by saying const state is equal to proxy. We call it as a function and then provide in the initial object. And then you have to export default that state. So you can think of this as React context. Whatever you define in here, you'll be able to utilize within your entire application. It is that simple. So what are we gonna have there? Well, we're gonna have one flag called intro, meaning are we currently on the homepage or are we not? We're gonna have our default color, which we can use later on. That's going to be EFBD4E, but of course you can use any other color as well. We're gonna have something known as is logo texture, which we're gonna use later on, meaning are we currently displaying the logo on our shirt? We're gonna have also is full texture, which is gonna be set to false at the start. And then just for the initial load of the shirt, before we upload any of our own logos or textures, we need to have the initial logo decal that's going to go on the shirt and that's going to be the path going to dot slash 3js.png. And also we need to have the initial full texture shirt decal, which is going to be dot slash 3js.png. Same thing. So far, you can just think of these as some empty default values. And what is this 3js? Well, it's nothing more than a simple 3js logo. So now we have set up our state and now we can go back to home and we can simply import it. The only thing you have to do is say import state from dot dot slash store. And we can immediately use it within our application. And how we use it? We use it by saying const snap, meaning it's one current snapshot of that state. 
and we say use snapshot and we pass in that default state. That is it. So we didn't have to set up any React context or anything else. We simply immediately specify the default values and we can use them within our application. While we go through the application, it's gonna start making even more sense. So no worries there. Great. Now we can start with creating the JSX of our application. We can first wrap everything with something known as an animate presence. This is a component by Framer Motion that's going to allow us to enable the animation of components that have been removed from the tree. Inside of there, we want to see if we are currently on the intro page, meaning on the home page. So we can say if we are on the snap.intro, in that case, we can render the home page data. And that's mostly going to be the motion.div, meaning it's going to be a regular div, but it's going to have some animations attached to it. And it's going to have a class name equal to home. And for the animations, we can provide a new object and we can spread dot, 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 slide animation. And we can say it's going to slide from the left. So it's going to look something like this. There we go. And this should have been a motion section. If we're going to be more precise, that's a new HTML5 semantic tag. So we can put this just a bit more to the side so everything fits in one line. There we go. Now within there, we're going to have a motion header. This is the first time while we're actually going to see something appear on the screen. So that's going to be a motion header. And within there, we can have an image. That image is going to have a source equal to dot slash 3js.png. It's also going to have an alt tag equal to logo, and it's going to have a class name equal to w-8, h-8, and object-contain. If we save that and reload the page, we cannot see anything on the screen yet. So what we can do is go to inspect and go to console. And we can see that source config motion.js does not provide an export name head T content. So it looks like I have a typo right here. It's supposed to be just head content animation. So if we reload, we are good. And we can see this great 3JS logo appear on top. Wonderful. This motion header is also going to have a slide in animation. So we can do dot, dot, dot slide animation. And we can say this one is going to slide down. So now if we reload, you can see how it slides from left, but also from top. There we go. This is looking great. Now below that motion header, we're going to have a motion dot div. And this div is going to have a class name equal to home dash content. And we're going to also spread all the head container animation. Inside of there, we're going to have another motion.div and we're going to spread the head text animation. Finally, inside of there, we can display our h1 that's going to have a class name equal to head dash text. And it's going to have a text of something like let's all uppercase. Then we can add a BR or a break tag that's going to just be visible on larger devices. So we can give it a class name equal to XL is block. Usually it's hidden. And we can say, do it. Let's do it. And there we go. You can see how nicely it slides right in. Below that, we can create another motion div. And this motion div is going to contain a P tag. And in there, I'm going to simply paste the text I already have. And you can also type it out. So we're going to say something like create your unique and exclusive shirt with our brand new 3D customization tool. We can then add a strong tag and say unleash your imagination space and define your own style. There we go. This is looking good. And let's also style it a bit by giving it a class name saying max dash W dash MD. This is going to make it take it a bit less horizontal space 
font is going to be normal. And text is going to be gray 600. That's the color. And it's going to be text dash base. And now to make this animate as well, we can spread the head content animation and also give it a class name equal to flex, flex call, and gap dash five to the div wrapping RP tag. Now, if we reload the page, you can see the text appears there as well. Great. And the last thing we need is a button to lead us from the home page to our customization page. So to implement that, we can create a new custom button self-closing component. If we save it, it's going to break, of course, because we haven't yet created it. So let's go to our file explorer. Let's go to the client side and source. And inside of the components, let's create a new custom button dot JSX. Inside of there, you can run RAFCE. And we can also create a new file within the components folder called index.js. There, we can import the custom button from that slash custom button. And we can also export it right here within an object. So what this allows us to do is now go back into the home page. And we can simply import custom button from dot dot slash components. And there we go. Our custom button is here. Now to that button, we're going to want to pass some props so we can utilize them within the button. So the props we can pass are going to be a type. We want this button to be a filled filled in button. We want to give it a title, something like customize it. We can give it a handle click. So what should we do once we click it? And that's going to be a callback function that's going to update our state. So this is the first time that I'm showing you how to update the Volsio state. Well, you simply do it. State that intro is equal to false. Um, this no longer breaks React's rules. You can just do it manually and it's going to work. And finally, we can pass some custom styles to this button. So that's going to be a W dash fit padding X of four, meaning padding horizontal, padding Y of 2.5, font dash bold and text dash small. Now, if you're wondering what any of these class names or styles do, simply visit tailwindcss.com, click this magnifying glass and type it in. And let's search for something like W dash fit. And if we go to sizing here, you can see that that's going to update the width. And there are also a lot of options. You can do it by fractions, you can do fit, you can do full. So whatever you're wondering about regarding Tailwind, you can simply search it right here. Be that padding, spacing, whatever you want, it's going to be right here. Tailwind is pretty simple to use. Essentially, the only thing it does is it takes regular CSS properties, and then it shows you how to do them with class names. Great. With that said, we can now control click into the custom button and implement it. To develop our custom button, we can start straight with the JSX by turning this div into, you can guess it, a button. Let's apply some class names, such as, let's give it a PX of two, meaning padding X. And within there, let's simply render the title that we have passed through the props. And there we have customize it, which is our title. Now let's also get all the other props, such as the type, the title, the custom styles, and the handle click as well. Now we can continue styling it by giving it a class name. Um, we can give it a padding Y of 1.2, a flex of one, and then a rounded dash MD. Now, this still doesn't look like a button, and that's because we haven't applied the custom styles right here. There we go. And even when we do, we're missing a color. We need to have our app theme color, which is going to be changeable. So what we can do is we can create a new style property, and there we can call a generate style to which we pass a type. We're gonna have two types of buttons in our application. So let's create a function called const generate style. 
which is going to accept a type. Then we want to see if the type is triple equal to filled. In that case, we want to do something. And yes, our button is filled. So we can return an object that's going to contain a background color for now can be set to black, as you can see. And then we need the color of the text, which is going to be set to white. Now we want to make this dynamic. If you remember correctly, within our Valshio state right here in the store, we have a color and this is the default color. So let's retrieve that color right here at the top by importing the state coming from data slash store. So we can now utilize that store right here at the top by saying const snap is equal to use snapshot and pass in the state. And then we can change the background color to be equal to snap dot color. And if we save that, everything of course breaks. And that's because we haven't imported use snapshot. So we can import use snapshot coming from Valshio. And there we go. We have a nice yellow color. That's looking great. For now, this is going to be everything we need to do to this button. Just one more part is to pass an on click, which is going to be equal to the handle click function. So now once we actually click it, we will no longer be on the home page because the snap that intro is going to be set to false, as you can see right there. So let's click it. There we go. That means that we want to focus on the customizer. We just moved from the home page to the customizer page. So let's go to the file explorer. Let's go to client source pages and then customizer. This is going to be the main part of our application. Inside of here, we're going to have a lot of imports. We want to import react, but we also want to import the use state and the use effect hooks. After that, we want to import something known as animate presence, which we have used so far, animate presence, as well as motion coming from frame or motion. And we want to get our use snapshot coming from Balshio. We also want to import something known as a config coming from dot dot slash config forward slash config. We're going to use this later on to set up the URL of our backend. We also want to import that state we have created coming from da dot slash store. We want to import an icon called download coming from da dot slash assets. And we want to import some helper functions such as download canvas to image, as well as reader coming from da dot slash config forward slash helpers. And finally, we need to import a couple of things from our constants, such as editor tabs, filter tabs, and decal types. And this is coming from da dot slash config forward slash constants. And you can control click any of these things to see what it is. These are just some default values, such as color picker, file picker, AI picker, and so on, which we can use later on within our application. We can also import some predefined motions such as fade animation and slide animation. And this is going to be coming from dot dot slash config forward slash motion. Great. Now inside of this page, we'll be using a lot of components. So what do you say that we take some time now and create the empty files for all of these components? Let's do them one by one. First, we're going to create the AI picker.jsx. And we can run refce inside of there. This is where we're going to pick the AI image. Then we're going to have a color picker. .jsx. Inside of here, we'll be able to pick the color of a shirt. We already have the custom button. So the next one is going to be the file picker.jsx. And we can run refce inside of there. Inside of here, we can simply upload the image. And finally, we need to add a tab.jsx and we can run refce. We're going to use this to switch between different tabs, such as color picker, AI picker, and file picker. And now that we have all of these components, we can simply export all of them from the index. 
So we can first import them. So let's duplicate this a couple of times. AI picker, color picker, file picker, and then tab. And finally, we want to export all of them too. So we can put them in new lines like this. And let's export them one by one. We have the AI picker, color picker, file picker, and tab. And if you're wondering how do I get all of these recommendations, they're coming from an extension called GitHub Copilot. So it's really helpful and I've been using it a lot recently. Great. Now we can go back to our customizer and we can import all of these components. So we can say import AI picker, color picker, custom button, file picker, and then a tab coming from dot dot slash components. I know we have a lot of imports, but now we can focus on what really matters. And that is creating our customizer. First of all, the JSX, but then also the logic for this great page. We're going to first wrap everything in the animate presence so we can allow for animations. And inside of there, we want to check, are we on the home page or are we on the customizer? And for that, we'll have to get access to our state. So we can say const snap is equal to use snapshot state. See how simple it is. And there we can say if not snap dot intro or the home page, then we want to show the rest of the code with just a regular parenthesis. So we can put everything inside of there. First of all, we can start with an empty React fragment and we can say something like customizer. Now, if we save this and reload the page, you can see that we have an error. So if we go to inspect and then to console, you can see that source config helpers.js does not provide download canvas to image. It's possible we mistyped it. So let's see down. There we go. There is a typo. So as soon as we fix the typo and reload, there we go. We're in the home page. We click customize and we are on the customizer. That's great. So let's delete this and let's actually start developing it. This right here is how the finished version looks like. And first we're going to focus on the left side right here, these tabs that you can switch from and then make some adjustments to the shirt. Okay. So let's do that right away by creating a new motion dot div. That's going to have a key equal to custom. It's going to have a class name equal to absolute top dash zero left dash zero two, and then Z dash 10. So we want to position it absolutely on the screen. And we can also make it slide from the left by doing dot, dot, dot slide animation from the left. And of course we have to put something into it. So what are we going to put in there? Well, that's going to be a div. So div, that div is going to have a class name equal to flex items dash center min dash h dash screen. So that's taking of the full height of the screen. And then we want to create a div that's going to have a class name of a class that we predefined, which is the editor tabs dash container and then tabs. And now if we save this, you can see just barely right here, a div instead of which the tabs will go. So now we can go through the editor tabs, which if you scroll up is going to be the constant for those three tabs. And we can say the map, we want to get each individual tab and we want to return a self closing tab component to which we need to pass a key equal to tab dot name, a tab equal to tab and a handle click, which is going to go to a callback function. And for now we can make it empty. And there we go. You can see these three tabs. So for now, I simply wanted to create this to give you an idea of where this is going to go on the screen. We're going to continue working on this later on, but now I want to make sure to do the rest of the layout really quickly so we can sooner rather than later jump onto the main part of the application which is creating this wonderful 3D model in the center of our screen.
So let's go below this motion.div and let's create another motion.div. This one is going to be for the back button. So see on the top right, we want to have this back button. So that motion div is going to have a class name equal to absolute Z-10, top-5, and right-5, meaning we want to position it on the top right of the screen, and we want to give it a fade animation. Inside of there, now it's pretty simple. The only thing we have to do is utilize the already created custom button component. The type is going to be filled. The title is going to be go back. The handle click is going to be a callback function that's going to call the state.intro and it's going to set it back to true, meaning we want to go to the home page. And we're going to set the custom styles to be equal to w fit, padding x of 4, padding y of 2.5, font bold, and text sm. And there we go. On top right, we can go back to the home page and we can go back to the customizer. This is already more functional. Now, below the shirt on the bottom, we're going to have some toggles, some filters. So first, we can turn on and off the logo. Then we can turn off and on the actual decal on the shirt, and then we can download the shirt. So let's quickly create those three buttons as well. We can go below this motion div right here to another motion div. This one is going to have a class name equal to filter tabs dash container. And they can also have a dot 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 slide animation. But this time, it's going to slide from down to up. So it's going to be slide animation up. Inside of there, we can do a similar thing, what we have done for the previous tabs. So let's go ahead and copy the editor tabs, paste them right here. And instead of editor tabs, we want to go over the filter tabs. We want to give it a key, a tab, a special property called is filter tab. Also a special property called is active tab, which for now we're going to leave as empty, as an empty string, and then a handle click. And then you can see that we're going to have two tabs right here at the bottom, three tabs on the left, the canvas right now at the top left, but that's going to be a shirt in the center. And then we have a go back button. Great. So you can see how nicely the tabs on the left slide in from the left side and tabs on the bottom slide in from the bottom side. Check that one more time. Looking great. But now that we have the basic layout of our application, not yet the functionality, just the layout, let's focus on what really matters. And that is going to the canvas folder and then to index.js. Already, we're going to dive into what 3.js is and how to implement it in the specific canvas using lighting, shadows, camera, and 3D models. We're going to cover every single aspect of 3.js React Fiber development right here. So with that said, let's get started with the main part of our video. As we always do, we can first import a couple of things. First of all, we're going to need, of course, the canvas coming from add react-3 forward slash fiber. And you can immediately notice that we cannot have the two instances of a variable named canvas. So let's change our component name to canvas model. And then we're going to keep the original canvas coming from fiber. Now we can also import something known as environment and center coming from add react dash three forward slash Dre. Now we'll have to use a couple of three JS components inside of our canvas. So let's go ahead and create them. The first one is going to be called backdrop JSX. And there for now we can run RAFCE. Backdrop is going to be this backsplash of yellow color that you can see behind the shirt right here. Then let's create another one. And that's going to be called a camera rig.jsx. And we can also run RAFCE inside of there. Of course, that's going to be the positioning of the camera. And finally, we can create the actual shirt model by saying shirt.jsx and then running RAFCE inside of there. 
And now inside of the canvas, we can of course import all of these components by saying import shirt coming from that slash shirt. We can also import the backdrop coming from that slash backdrop. And finally, we can import the camera rig coming from that slash camera rig. And now we can slowly start utilizing all of these components. So first of all, we can click customize it to go into the customization page. And you can see that we have the canvas here at the top left. Now, instead of just a text of canvas, let's actually render a canvas component. This is where everything will go. First of all, we're going to apply some ambient lighting. So we can say ambient light. That's going to be a self-closing component with the intensity equal to 0.5. If we save that, you cannot see anything yet because we are on the light screen. Then we also want to add something known as an environment. And environments accept different presets. So in this case, we can give it a preset equal to city. If you hover over it, this is going to add the effect on the whole screen. Finally, we can enter the camera rig right here. And then inside of there, we can leave that backdrop as a self-closing component. And then in the center, we can create a shirt. Now, if we save this, you can see nothing seems to be working. So let's go to inspect and then let's open up the console. And as you can see, it says the div is not the part of three namespace, which says that some of our components which we're using right here, like the camera rig or the backdrop and the shirt are not displaying three JS properties and components, rather just regular divs, which is causing it to break. So for now we can comment out the camera rig and the backdrop, and we can control click into the shirt and turn this into a real 3D model so we can see it on the screen. So to do this, we first have to import a couple of things, and that's going to be import something known as easing coming from MMATH or math. We can also import the use snapshot coming from Volsio. We can also import the use frame coming from React 3 Fiber. And then we need a couple more things from React Dre that's going to be a decal, meaning some kind of a mesh or a texture. We need to use GLTF to be able to use the 3D model and then the use texture to be able to apply that texture. And all of that is coming from add react 3 forward slash Dre. And finally, we can import our store too. So that's going to be import state from the store. Great. Now we already know how simple it is to use that state. We just have to say const snap is equal to use snapshot and then we pass in the state. Now, finally, let me show you how we can import a 3D model. You just have to say const, you get the nodes as well as the materials and you specify that to be equal to use GLTF hook and then you point it to the path where that shirt is stored. So that's shirt underscore baked dot GLB. So now if you go to public, you can see this shirt baked GLB, which is the actual 3D file. Great. Now let's create two textures that we're going to apply to that shirt. That's going to be const logo texture, which is going to go in the middle of the screen. So we can say is equal to use texture. And that's going to be equal to snap dot logo decal. Remember that snap is just the store that we stored here. And currently it's a path pointing to a regular PNG image. And now we can duplicate that. And we're going to also display a full texture, which is going to go over the entire shirt. And that's going to be equal to snap dot full decal. Great. Finally, let's display that shirt model. We can close the console just to have a clean working slate. And instead of rendering a div, we're going to render a group. Inside of that group, we're going to have a mesh element. And that mesh is going to have a couple of properties. It's going to have a cast shadow property, meaning that it is going to cast shadows. It's going to have a geometry equal to nodes dot 
t underscore shirt underscore male dot geometry. It's going to have a material equal to materials dot Lambert one. That's the material used for this shirt. And then we can specify the material dash roughness. And that's going to be equal to one. And finally, dispose is going to be equal to null. I'm not really sure what this one does. Maybe if we hover over it, or if you Google it, we can figure that out. But we needed it to make this work. Now, if we save it, there we go. As you can see, we have our shirt, and it is right in the center of the screen, because we use this center property. So that is great. Although it is really small at this point, no worries, because we're going to make it bigger. And how can we make it bigger? Well, that's going to be with the camera rig, we need to kind of point the camera a bit closer to our actual model. So what do you say now that we have our mesh and the shirt, we can go back, and we can turn on this camera rig that's wrapping the shirt, we can go into it. And now of course, it's going to break because the camera ring is not the actual camera. But once we implement it, it's going to actually work. So the first step we have to do is, of course, get some imports, such as import use frame, coming from add react dash three fiber, we can import the same easing coming from math. And we can import the use snapshot coming from Volshio. we can also import that state, which is equal to or coming from that dot slash store. Now, within our camera rig, we're passing some children components, specifically the center containing the shirt. So to be able to display it, we have to get it from the children react prop. And then we can render it out, we can do that by returning a group. And that group is going to render the children, like so And there we go, our shirt came back means that we are properly following all the three JS rules. But with that said, we want to modify it a bit, we want to move the camera closer. So what we can do is we can create a new ref const group is equal to use ref. And we're going to use this ref later on to update the state. So we can simply connect that ref to our group right here by saying ref is equal to group. Now, as soon as we do this, you can notice that it breaks again, but no worries, we're here to fix it. So it says that the use ref is not defined. So the only thing we have to do is we have to define the use ref right here coming from react. Great. And we have our shirt again. Now in the final model, the shirt is much, much bigger, but it also rotates, which is the whole point of 3d models. So what do you say that we implement that rotation next? First, we can get the state by saying const snap is equal to use snapshot, and then we pass in the state. And then we can set the model rotation. So I'm going to even add a comment right here, set the model rotation smoothly. And we can do that by using the easing property easing dot damp e like this, we call it as a function. And now we're going to pass a couple of properties to it. We're going to pass the group dot current dot rotation. Then we're going to need to pass a couple of variables, you can see the target, the x, the y and the z axis. So let's create a new array. First, we're going to position it at state dot pointer dot y divided by 10. Then the second one, the y axis is going to be minus state dot pointer dot x divided by five. And then the z axis is going to be zero. Now this is going to break it one more time, because we also have to provide the smooth time, which in this case is going to be set to 0 0.25. And finally, we need something known as a delta, meaning the difference. And how are we going to get that? Well, we need to call the use frame hook. So right here, we're going to call the use frame. And this hook allows you to execute code on every rendered frame. So we can run different effects, update controls and so on. So we can use the frame, it accepts a callback function right here, like this. And then we can put all of this code, the easing inside of the use frame, like so. And there we get the state and we get the delta, meaning the difference from the last frame that happened. And we can pass the delta right here as the last parameter to easing. Now, if we save this, we're again good. 
but we cannot move the shirt yet. No worries, we're gonna fix that really soon. We want to make this shirt look good on all different screen sizes. Right now we're looking at it from the mobile view, but we still want it to be responsive. So that's why we can create some breakpoints. We can say const is breakpoint is equal to window dot inner width is lower than or equal to 1260 pixels. And then we also have the mobile. So const is mobile is going to be equal to window dot inner width is lower or equal to 600 pixels. So this is going to ensure that we can make the shirt the proper size on all different screen sizes. Now let's set the initial position of the model. And we can do that by saying let target position is going to be equal to, I found the value minus 0 0.4, 0 and 2 to work best right off the bat. But now we can modify it. So we can say if snap that intro, meaning if we are on the home page, remember here, then we want to reposition it. We want to say if is breakpoint, then we want to set the target position to 0, 0, and then 2. If we are on the snap intro, and if we are on mobile, so if is mobile, then the target position is going to be 0, 0 0.2, and then 2.5. And finally, else, if we're not on the intro, if we're on the customizer page, then we can check if is mobile. In that case, the target position can be almost the same. We can have it here. 0, 0, 2.5. And then we can also have an else where we're going to set the target position to be equal to 0, 0, 2. So these are just some values to make the shirt work on all different screen sizes. And now is the time that we set the camera position. So set model camera position. To do that, we can call the easing again, dot damp, but in this case, damp three, we can pass the state dot camera dot position. This is what we have been changing here. The second parameter is going to be the target. That's going to be the target position. Then we have the smooth time, which is going to be 0 0.25. And then we pass in the delta. And if we save it, you can see how the shirt now moves. And it also got a bit bigger. And now check this out. If I click customize, it moved to the center again, but really smoothly and slowly. So now we have some interaction with the shirt, you can see it is moving, but still it doesn't have a lot of texture and nothing interesting is going on. So we cannot really see how great it is. But so far, so good. Our camera is now fully done. We can jump out of the camera and we can go back to improving our shirt model. Right here inside of the shirt's mesh, we need to know if we're currently showing the logo on the shirt or are we showing the full texture. So this is it, currently showing the logo, not showing the logo, and then showing the full texture and not showing the full texture. So to do that, we can first call the snap, which is our state, and then check if is full texture, then we're going to apply a decal that's going to be of that full texture. And we can do the same to that decal, we can pass a position that's going to be equal to an array of 0, 0, 0. We can also pass a rotation that's going to be equal to 0, 0, 0. We can pass a scale equal to 1, which is going to take the full space of the model. And then we also need a map, which is going to render that full texture right here. If we save that, you won't be able to see anything yet. And now what if we have the logo? Well, that's easy. We're going to simply duplicate this below. We're going to say snap is logo texture. We're going to change the positioning just a bit. I found the value of 0 0.04 and 0 0.15 to work best. The scale is going to be much smaller. It's going to be 0 0.15. And then the map is not going to be the full texture. It's going to be the logo texture right here. And there we go. You can see the logo in our state is currently turned on. So that's why it's showing. 
If we switch it off here, you can see it is gone. And if we switch the full texture on, you can see we have the texture. So right now we can change these statically, but soon enough, we're going to add buttons right here below so we can change these dynamically. But it's good to know that we can see the logo on our shirt. Now we can change the quality of the texture by changing the property called map and isotropy, and we can set it to 16. We can also change something known as a depth test which is going to ensure to render on top of the other objects in the scene. And that can be set to false. We want to show it on the shirt. And then also depth right, which we're going to set to true. There we go. So I figured these work best while displaying that logo on there. And believe it or not, that's mostly going to be it for the shirt. But we're going to just play a bit more with the actual easing to apply the color smoothly and not dramatically. And we can do that by using the use frame hook we already used before. We're going to get a callback function with the state and the delta. And then inside of there, we can simply say easing dot damp C, we can pass in the materials. So materials dot Lambert one dot color. So first we pass the color, then we pass the current color, snap that color, we pass the 0 0.25 for the smooth time and then the delta value. So essentially, we're just ensuring that we apply the color smoothly. And now there was one interesting thing that I figured out while creating this project. And that is that the shirt sometimes would not update. And to fix it, I needed to provide a key to this group right here. And the key cannot simply be a state, I had to recreate a string of the current state that we can pass in. So const state string is equal to JSON that stringify, and then we pass in the current state. So this tracks state changes, and then we pass in the state string. This way, React will render the model whenever the state changes. Great. So now if we save this, this is looking good. We have our model. And now we can go back and we can focus on the backdrop. That's going to ensure that we have those cool lights showing behind the shirt. So if we bring back the backdrop, it's going to break again because it's a regular div, but soon enough, we'll be able to change it to a real 3JS property. So inside of here, let's import something known as easing coming from math. Let's import the use ref hook coming from React. Let's also import the use frame from React 3 Fiber we used before. And this time we're going to work and play with shadows. So we can import accumulative shadows and randomized light coming from react three Dre. You can see Dre is quite useful because it gives you a lot of these helper utility functions we can use on our 3d models. So let's play with those shadows. Let's render a component called accumulative shadows. Inside of there, we can render the randomized light. And you know what, for good measure, let's do two randomized lights. But first, let's add some properties to it. Now, if we save this, you can see this is good, but the shirt is nowhere to be seen. So what we can do is let's add an amount to this randomized light. And that's going to be four. But I'm wondering, where is the shirt? So maybe we have to change the position of the backdrop to be able to see it. Let's set the position to be equal to an array of 0, 0, and then minus 0 0.14. And even though that's positioned right, we still cannot see the shirt. What if I comment out the backdrop and reload the page? Nope, shirt is still nowhere to be seen. Let's go ahead and open the inspect element and the console too. And we can see we have an open loop saying reading color on shirt line 16. It cannot read it. So that's happening right here, I'm guessing. And we need to fix this quickly because it's just ramping up the errors. So to fix that, I misspelled the Lambert right here, which is the material. So it's Lambert, not Lamber. And with that, we do get the color of our shirt, which makes it look so much better. That's looking great. So now if we go back to here, and uncomment the backdrop, 
There we go. You can see what we meant when we added this randomized light or shadow. But of course, we have to play with it to make it so much better. Now, if we expand our browser a bit, you can see the shirt is going to expand, but it is still a bit too small. So let's make the shirt just a bit bigger before we finalize the backdrop. And we can do that by playing with the canvas. Inside of the canvas, we can turn on the shadows and we can also change the camera positioning. So we can say camera position is going to be set to zero, zero, zero. And then most importantly, the FOV or the field of view is going to be set to 25. This is going to bring the camera closer. Now, if we reload the page, you can see the shirt now just looks so much better. But of course, these backdrop and the shadows are not collaborating with us so far. No worries, we're gonna make that work soon. Before we do that, let's apply a GL property right here. That means to preserve the buffers later on. And that's going to be preserve drawing buffer is set to true. Finally, we can give it a class name equal to w dash full for full width max dash w dash full. So this is going to be the max width 100% h dash full for full height and transition dash all as well as ease dash in. Great. Now our canvas is done. Our shirt is done and their camera rig is done. We just have to focus on that backdrop to have this nice looking backsplash of color and shadow behind our shirt. So to make that happen, let's focus on these shadows and lights. First of all, this randomized light, let's see how it looks like. What if I remove the amount? You can see it is still here because we have the shadow. So instead of focusing on the light first, let's get rid of this shadow. Let's make that work first because this is not really looking good. So first we need to create a ref by saying const shadows is equal to use ref because we need to reference to that specific shadow later on. So let's give it a ref equal to shadows. We can also set the temporal variable, which means it's going to smooth out the edges of the shadow over time. Then we can set the frames to be equal to 60, meaning the frames are going to render in 60 frames. We can also add the alpha test, which is going to set the transparency of the shadows to 0 0.85. We want to give it a scale equal to 10 and a rotation equal to math.py over two, and then zero, zero. And we can leave the position as it is. Now, if we save this, you can see everything became dark, which is good. It really makes our model pop. But now let's bring back those randomized lights. Let's give it the amount of four, and you can immediately see how it just flashed. But we wanna keep it there. So let's spread the radius a bit to something like nine. Let's set the intensity to 0 0.55. Let's set the ambient to 0 0.25. Okay, it's already just a bit lighter. And let's set the position of that light to be an array of five, five, and then minus 10. Okay, there we go. So you can see now that light is not centrally hitting the shirt. It's coming from somewhere on the top right and it leaves a great shadow on that shirt. That is looking great. So this is a light source in a 3D scene. Now we can duplicate that right below and we can have the other one with the amount four, radius five, maybe a bit of a lower intensity. You can play with this as much as you like. We can set the ambient to 0 0.55 and we can change that to come from the different angle. So let's do minus five five, and then something like minus nine. And if we save this, you can see now they're coming from two different sides and they cast different shadows. But of course, feel free to play with the lights as much as possible. Feel free to play with the camera rig as well. And feel free to play with the shirt model, most importantly. You can also change some things right here in the canvas. Maybe the FOV can be set to something like 50. If you reload, that's going to make the shirt smaller. You can make it something like 10 to come really close with the camera onto that shirt. So right now you can see the full power of the texture appearing on the shirt. And you can see this is like a sticker on that shirt.
looking great. But of course, let's bring that back to 25 as with that value, the full shirt fits on the screen. So this is looking great already. And with that, we're done with our camera, we're done with our backdrop, and we are done with our shirt. Now we are ready to move all the way back to our app and then to our customizer. Now we can make all of these tabs work and the ones on the bottom too. So we can start adding, uploading different materials, different textures, and different colors to the shirt. Of course, we're gonna start with the tabs first. So the first tab on our list is going to be the color tab. So let's dive into the tab. And here, we're gonna implement all of these different tabs, such as the file input, color input, and then also the AI image upload input, which is quite an interesting one. So let's first start with the overall look and feel of the tabs. To start implementing our tabs, we can import the use snapshot hook coming from Volcio. We can also import the state coming from dot dot slash store. As we always do, we can now get the snapshot of that store by saying const snap is equal to use snapshot state. And if you remember correctly, inside of the customizer, we passed a couple of props to our tab here and also here. So we have things like a tab, is filter tab, is active tab, and the handle click. So let's get those props right here. Tab is filter, tab, filter is the one on the bottom. We have is active tab. And then finally, the handle click. Great. Now let's actually change this from just being tab to the actual JSX of the tab. We can do that by giving each div a key equal to tab.name. We can give it a class name equal to a dynamic template string of tab-btn. And then if it is filter tab, so if is filter tab, in that case, we can render the rounded dash full as well as glass morphism. And if it is not a filter tab, then we can simply do something like rounded dash four. Now, if we save that, you can see that now we have this glass on the left side and we have nothing on the bottom side. Now we can also give it an on click, which is going to be equal to the handle click. And now we have to give it styles depending on if it is currently active. So we can create a new property at the top, const active styles. And there we can say if is filter tab and is active tab. In that case, we want to give it a property, a style of background color, which is equal to snap dot color and opacity equal to 0 0.5. If it is not an active tab, then we want to apply it not active styles, which is going to be a background color equal to transparent. And we want to set the opacity to one. And now we can simply apply those class names or rather styles to our div. And you can see nothing is currently active, so we cannot see anything. Now let's actually render something within that div. That's going to be a self-closing image tag with a source equal to tab that icon. And there we go. Immediately this starts looking so much better because we have our colors, our files, the AI generator, and then we can show or hide the actual shirt and the logo. Great. We can give it an alt equal to tab that name, and we can give it a class name equal to, it's going to be dynamic. If is filter tab, in that case, we want to give it something like W dash two thirds and H dash two thirds like this. And otherwise, we want to set the width to be 11 out of 12 and h 11 out of 12 as well and object dash contain. I found these values to work best. There we go. So now this is looking good. These on the bottom are just a bit smaller. And that is it for the actual tab layout. But now we have to create a model for once we click on a specific tab for it to be marked as active 
and we also need to open up the corresponding picker. So to do that, we can go back to customizer and there we can see that we have our actual tabs, but once we click them, nothing actually happens. So what we can do is scroll all the way to the top of the customizer and create a new function. And this function is going to show tab content depending on the active tab. So that's going to be const generate tab content. And it's not going to take anything as the parameter because we're going to keep track of the active tab within our state. So right here as the local state of our application, we can create a couple of use states. The first use state is going to be a file. Later on, we'll need to upload files. So we're going to have file, set file, at the start set to an empty string. Then we'll also be working with the AI prompt. So we need to create a new use state field for the AI prompt. Set prompt at the start set to an empty string. We also need a loading state. Are we currently generating the image or not? So we can create a new use state field called generating IMG. And also that's going to be set to false at the start. But then most importantly, we need to have two additional active states. So let's create a first one. Use state is active editor tab, set active editor tab at the start set to an empty string. And then use state active filter tab, set active filter tab. And that's going to be set to an object containing logo shirt set to true at the start and then stylish shirt set to false. So this is going to be able to trigger, are we currently showing the logo? Are we showing the full texture? And then also the active editor is going to show us which one are we changing, the color, the file, or the AI image generation prompt. So now we have everything we need to implement our function generate tab content. So how this is going to work is we're going to have a switch statement. And that switch is going to look for the active editor tab. If the active editor tab is color picker, then we want to return a self closing color picker component. If the case is a file picker, in that case, we want to return, I think you can guess it, a file picker. And then if the case is the AI picker, in that case, we can return the AI picker. And the default is going to be just a return of null. Great. So now we're going to display those additional components on top of our current layout, of course, using the absolute positioning. Once we click on them, the first one on the list is going to be the color picker. But of course, for that to happen, we have to call the generate tab content somewhere. So we're going to call it right here below our editor tabs. So they're going to be here, editor tabs. And then we want to call the generate tab content. So immediately it's going to show it on top once we actually activate a specific tab. So now on the editor tabs, we can call the set active editor tab to tab that name. Great. So now once we click on the color, we can see color picker is the currently active one. And if we click on the file picker and AI picker, you can see these are changing. But right now they're just displaying the text of that specific picker. But of course, we need to show it right here, like we do on the finished application right next to it. So let's focus on the color picker first by going to components, and then color picker. Implementing the color picker is going to be incredibly straightforward as we're going to use a package called sketch picker, or rather the react color package. And then one of their pickers is called a sketch picker. Implementing the color picker is going to be incredibly simple because we're going to use the sketch picker coming from react color package. That's going to allow us to really easily have a wonderful looking color picker. After that, we can import the use snapshot from Volsio, and we can also import the state coming from dot dot slash store. 
you already know how we get the values. That's going to be const snap is equal to use snapshot to which we pass the state. And then we can start with creating our color picker. So we can turn this from just being a regular div to being a div that has a class name equal to absolute left dash full and then margin left three. Now, if we save that and click here, we cannot see anything because that div is currently empty. So inside of there, we can render the self-closing sketch picker component. And to it, we can pass a couple of things. We can pass the default color, which is going to be snap.color. That is that color that is coming from our state right here. And of course, you can change it to some other color. In this case, we have this yellow one. And with that, immediately, we have this wonderful looking color picker. Although you still cannot change the color. So let's make that work as well. We can say disable alpha. That's kind of the opacity that we have. So if we save that, now we have only the colors. Then you can add the on change. That's going to be a callback function where you get the color. And then we can just modify the color in the state by saying state.color is equal to color.hex. And that's going to allow you to modify it. It is that simple. You can change all of the colors right here. I think you have a couple million colors to choose from, maybe even more. So just go wild. This green color is a, is a cool one. And you also have some preset colors. In case you want to add some of your own preset colors, you can just say preset colors, open up an array, and then start typing some values in there. So if we do this, you can see we have different colors. Of course, you can add your own variants. In this case, I'm just going to paste some that I found to work the best. There we go. So now we have these great looking colors at the bottom. But of course, feel free to play with these and add your own preset colors, or just turn this off and let the picker suggest you some colors automatically. This is looking great. And with that said, the color picker is now fully implemented. Now we can go back to the customizer, to the generate tab content, and we can focus on the file picker, where we'll be finally able to upload our own images to display them as the logo, but also as the entire gradient background. For that to work, we'll have to pass in a couple of props. First of all, we'll have to pass the file equal to file, set file equal to set file, and these are coming, as you might already know, from the state. But now we'll also have to create a special function, const read file, which is going to take in the type of the file, and then we have to pass it to the reader function to get the file data. So we can say reader, to which we pass the file, then we do a dot then, where we get the result, and then we want to pass that file to the decals of the shirt, depending on the type of that image. So that's going to look like this, handle decals, to which we pass the type and the result. And once we do that, we want to set the active editor tab to be equal to an empty string, meaning we want to reset it. But of course, that handle decals function hasn't yet been implemented. So we can say const handle decals. And this is going to take in the type and the result. And then based on this, we want to update our shirt. So first of all, the type, as you already know, can be a logo or can be a full texture. We even define that in our original state. If you look right here, it is logo texture is full texture. So if you reload the page and go back in here, you can see that we have the logo and the full decal. So these are the two different options. Just to show you how that looks like on our finished site, you can toggle the logo on and off, but you can also toggle the full texture on and off. Great. Now with that said, we can scroll down and we can implement the function. We can first get the decal type by saying const decal type is equal to decal types, and then we pass in the type. Then we need to update the state by saying state decal type dot state property is equal to result. So in here, we're updating the state right here that I showed you. So if you go into the store, we're updating these values right here. 
And then we want to say, if no active filter tab, to which we pass the decal type dot filter tab, meaning we want to figure out if that decal is currently active, be that the logo, which now breaks, or the texture. In that case, we want to call the handle active filter tab function to which we pass the decal type dot filter tab. And this is yet another function that we don't yet have. So we can create it right away. It's called const handle active filter tab to which we pass the tab name. So once again, we're doing this to keep in mind, are we currently showing the logo or not? Or are we showing the texture or maybe even both? So we need to be able to handle that with these functions. So what can we do there? Well, we can create a new switch statement that's going to take in the tab name. If the case is logo shirt, then we want to add the state that is logo texture to be equal to not active filter tab. And then we pass in the tab name. So we want to toggle it on or off and we want to break. Then if the case is stylish shirt, in that case, we want to change the state that is full texture to be equal to not active filter tab tab name. And then the default is going to be state dot is logo texture is true. And then state that is logo texture is false. Or no, I think we had it the other way around is logo is true is full is false. So is logo is true is full is false. There we go. So I know this might be a bit confusing, but now that's going to allow us to actually toggle on and off. Are we showing the shirt? Are we showing the texture? Are we showing both? Or are we showing neither? Great. With that said, we were left in the read file function. We were trying to read that specific file. And now we're doing that successfully and we're handling the decals based off of that. So now we can utilize this read file function and we can pass it over to our file picker. Read file is equal to read file, which allows us to now control click into the file picker and we can finally start implementing it. And unlike using the package for implementing the color picker, we're going to implement the file picker entirely from scratch. So the only import we're going to need is going to be the custom button component we have created before. And don't forget, inside of there, we're getting the file, the set file, and finally the read file. Great. So our file picker is going to be a div with a class name equal to file picker dash container. Now, if we save it and click the file icon here, you can see we have the file container right there. Or no, we don't. This is already the finished version because I was on this URL. We're going to move to the current version and there you can see an empty div. I was wondering why all of this is here, even though we haven't implemented yet. There we go. So this is how it should look like. And now we're going to have a div inside of there. That div is going to have a class name equal to flex of one flex and then flex dash column to be able to show all the elements one below another. And inside of there, we want to render a self closing input component. That input is going to have the ID equal to file dash upload. It's going to have a type equal to file. It's going to accept only the image properties, meaning all images. And it's going to have an on change property equal to a callback function where we get the event. And then we set the file to be equal to e.target.files zero. So it takes the first image that we pass. And then we can pass the label. That label is going to say upload file, and it's going to be connected to the above input by giving it an HTML4 file dash upload and a class name equal to file picker dash label. And there we go. There's the upload file button. Now below that, 
we want to show which file have we uploaded. So we can say, inside of curly braces, if file is triple equal to an empty string, then we can say no file selected. Else we can show the file name. There we go. Currently, no file has been selected. Let's also style that a bit by giving it a class name MT2 to divide it a bit from the top. Text dash gray dash 500. Text dash extra small. And truncate in case the name of the file is a bit too long. Great. Finally, below this P tag and below this div, we want to create a wrapper for our buttons. So let's create a div that's going to have a class name equal to MT of four margin top of four to divide it from the top flex flex dash wrap and gap dash three. Inside of there, we want to show a custom button. This button is going to have a type equal to outline. We haven't had this before. It's going to have a title equal to logo, a handle click equal to a callback function where we call read file and pass in the logo, and then a custom styles equal to text dash XS. And there we go. You can see this logo right here. Now we want to duplicate that below. We're going to have a full button this time or filled button. It's going to be for the full texture. We're going to update the full texture. I hope that now you can see what I meant when changing the type of the decal on the read file function. And then the text XS is going to remain. So if we save it, now we have two different buttons, but they look a bit off. And that's because we haven't yet implemented the custom outline button. You can see we have only generated the styles for the filled button. So if we go back into the custom button component right here, we can say else if type is triple equal to outline. In that case, we can return an object with border width of one pixel, a border color of snap that color, and also a color of the text equal to snap dot color. There we go. So now we can see this button right here, although it disappeared a bit. So there is this really cool thing we can do. We can read the background color that we have specified right here. And then based on that, we need to apply a proper contrast for the actual color. See this full button at the bottom. We can see the text clearly because it is written in white on black. But if I change the color to white and go back, the text disappears. That's because we don't have proper contrast. So instead of simply setting the color to white, we want to be able to generate the contrasting color. And this is something that I have asked chat GPT to do for me. So we can import a function called get contrasting color from dot dot slash config forward slash helpers. So if you go into it, you can see this is how that function looks like. It takes in the colors, figures out the brightness, and then returns either black or white, depending on that brightness. That's cool that ChatGPT can do that kind of things. So now that we have that, instead of simply rendering the FFF, we can get contrasting color and then pass in the snap that color. And immediately you can see that this turns to black as does the text on the top right. So now if we change it, we have really light red, but if we go darker, it's good. But as we move towards the lighter color, at one point it's going to switch there we go. It's going to switch back the text to black. So it is better contrasted. Great. With that said, our buttons are now done, but something still seems to be out of the place because this is how it should look like. They should be one next to another, but in our version, they're looking like this. So if we go back to our custom file picker, I can see the gap of 36, but the gap was supposed to be just three. So if I fix that, we have those two great looking buttons. So far, this is looking great. Keep in mind, even though it's hard to see on some colors right now, it's going to be much easier if you're on a desktop device. Right now we're looking at in a mobile view, but this is looking great. Now the file picker is fully done. It is reading the file. And then these functions that we have created inside of the customizer 
should actually update the file and set it as a decal to our shirt. So let's go ahead and give it a try. I'm going to click upload file. And as you can see, I have downloaded some of the JS mastery logos. Of course you can download something else. In this case, I'm going to try this white PNG JS mastery logo upload. You can see white dot PNG here, and then you can choose whether you want to apply it as a logo or as a full texture. Let's go with the logo first. And there we go. It's looking great, but it wasn't in a square format. So it looks a bit off. But if I go ahead and go to upload and use a square logo from JS mastery pro this time, you can see this looks so much better. Now we can expand it to admire it in its full glory. We have a wonderful looking shirt with a great logo right here. And of course we can change the colors too. Since we have a white logo, of course, darker colors are going to look a bit better on this one, such as this great looking bluish or reddish one, but already this is looking great. Now that I'm seeing a JS mastery logo on a shirt, it gave me an idea of creating JS mastery merch. So what do you say? Let me know down in the comments if you'd want me to create the first ever JS mastery merch for real fans. If you're watching this video later than it was published, then there even might be a special discount for the first ever JSM merch right in the description of this video. With that said, let me know down in the comments if that's something you would be interested in. Great. Now, what would happen if we try to upload a file and then make it a full? Right now, that doesn't work. And that's because of these filters at the bottom. So let's collapse our browser. And let's look into how we can fix the turning off and on the logo and the texture. That's going to be right here with the filter tabs. And as you can see, the handle click is currently just doing nothing. So what we need to do is we need to handle active filter tab, and we need to pass in the tab that name. And also we need to change the active tab to be equal to active filter tab, and then the tab name. That way we can see the logo is currently active, but we can toggle it off, unfortunately not on. So that's something we need to look into. And we can also do this, which brings back the logo. This is currently not working as it's supposed to. So let's go into the handle active filter tab. And there we can see that we have logo shirt. So state is logo texture, not active filter tab tab name. This is looking good. Then we have stylish shirt. This is also looking good. And we are toggling on and off the full texture. And then in here we have is logo true is full false. But now we're missing a really important part. And that is this switch is just changing the state. But now after setting the state, we need to set the active filter tab to update the UI. So what we can do there is we can set active filter tab. Since we'll be working with the previous state, we need to create it as a callback function containing the prep state. And there we need to return an object that's going to spread the previous state, but then it's going to update the tab name to be equal to previous state and then that same tab name. But then we're going to take the tab name and then we're going to set it to be equal to not previous state tab name, meaning it's going to toggle it on and off. So now if we do it, and if we click, you can see it's actually toggling on and off the logo. And if we click the texture, well, that apparently seems to be broken right now because it just brings back the logo. So that's definitely something we need to look into. That's going to be that second filter tab that we have, which is the stylish shirt. So if we go back to where we're setting it, that's going to be stylish shirt, and that's going to set the full texture. So far, this is looking good to me. I don't see any reason why this wouldn't be working, but that's definitely something we can explore later on. For now, the most important part is that we can see the logo. Well, let's try to upload another image, maybe this one, and let's try to update it as a full. And nope, still, it doesn't want to apply it. It's still applying just the logo. So for now, we can let this be. 
and then we can revisit it once we actually implement one of the cooler parts of our application, of course, alongside this cool 3D model, and that is the AI picker component, allowing us to tell AI what we want to add to the shirt, and it's immediately going to add it. So let's start focusing on that right away. First, we need to pass it a couple of props. That's going to be the states we have already created, such as prompt equal to prompt, set prompt equal to set prompt, generating IMG to generating IMG, which is the loading state. And then we're going to also need a handle submit. So what's going to happen once we submit our prompt? And this function we haven't yet created, so we can do it right away, right here below. Const handle submit is equal to an async function that's going to take in a type. Do we want to create a logo or a full texture? And then we can check if there is no prompt, we can simply return alert, please enter a prompt. And if there is a prompt, then we can open a new try and catch block. And just to be precise, we're going to also add a finally part to that try and catch block. So if we have an error, we're going to simply alert that error so we can see what's happening. And finally, we want to reset the loader. So set generating image is false. And then set active editor tab is going to be set to nothing. And then in the try, we're going to actually call our backend to generate an AI image. Isn't that great? So let's get started with that part right away. But of course, to make that happen, we have to close all of the currently open front end files, we have to collapse it, and we have to create a new folder right here called server. So we're going to create an entire backend Node.js server to be able to call that API and then deliver the generated image all the way to the client. So to initialize our server, we can open up the terminal, press control C to stop it from running cd dot dot, and then cd server to move into it. There we can run npm init dash y. This is going to generate all the files and folders, meaning just the package JSON that we need to start creating our server. Inside of that package JSON, you're going to see that we have some scripts, we want to add a new start script in there, that's going to call the nodemon index meaning it's just going to keep this index file running. So it looks into all of the changes. We also want to add a new type equal to module that's going to allow us to use the modern import export syntax like the one we use in react. And then we'll have to install a couple of dependencies. So let's run npm install. Once again, make sure that you're in the server directory. And let's install cloudinary, which we're going to use to save images. Let's do course to allow for cross origin requests, dot env for storing our environment variables, express, of course, mongoose, nodemon, and finally, open AI. These are going to be all the packages that we're going to need to spin up this fairly simple, but also incredibly powerful backend that's going to allow us to generate all of the images we want and put it straight on the shirt. And immediately these packages got installed. And now all that we have to do is create a new index.js file, which we can do right within the server folder. Let's create a new index.js. And inside of there, we'll have to do the usual stuff of setting up a regular express server. So to do that, we can first import express from express. We can also import everything or star as .env coming from .env. We can import the course for cross origin requests coming from course. And to set up environment variables, we have to call .env.config. Finally, we need to set up the express application by running const app is equal to express. We need to set up a couple of pieces of middleware by calling the app.use command and we need to pass course, otherwise, we're going to have that cross origin problems as we usually do. We also need to set the app that use to specify the weight of the payload that we can send. So we can say the limit is going to be 50 megabytes. Finally, we can create a demo route by saying app.get 
that's going to be just forward slash. And then there, we can simply res that status of 200 and then dot JSON, where we can pass a message equal to hello from Dali. This is going to be our backend. And immediately now, if we run our server by running the npm start command while in the server, it should run it. Well, not yet because it's not going to spin it. Uh, it's running it, but we're not hosting it anywhere. So we also need to be able to listen on a specific port. And we can do that by saying app.listen. That's going to be port 8080, or you can use 5000 as well. And there, we're going to simply console log server has started on port 8080. And that's going to be inside of a string. So now if we save this, you can see that we can open up a new tab. and simply go to localhost 8080. And there you're going to get a new hello from Dali message right here as a JSON output. That's great. But now we actually have to create some file and folder structure, but trust me, it's going to be fairly straightforward. The only thing we need is one folder called routes. And inside of there, we're going to create a new dali.routes.js inside of which the logic for the interaction with the DALI API will go. So inside of there, we can import express coming from express. We can import everything as .env coming from .env. And we can import a couple of things from the open AI package, such as configuration and open AI API. That's coming from open AI. As we said, to be able to use environment variables, we need to specify the .env.config. And in this case, we're going to create some new additional routes. So we can specify a router by saying const router is equal to express.router. And let's create a couple of routes, such as router.route, just forward slash, dot get, we're going to have a callback function with the rec and the res. And there, we simply want to res that status of 200.json message. We can do hello from DALI 2.0, or we can do hello from DALI routes. So we know that we are in this specific file. And then we have to export default router. And now where is this going to be? What is this route? Well, we have to connect it to our index.js. So inside of there, we can first import DALI routes from dot slash routes forward slash DALI dot routes. And don't forget, we're in node here. So you have to add the dot JS. We have to also add the file extension. Then we have to use those routes or consume them as a middleware by saying app dot use forward slash API forward slash V1 forward slash DALI. And then we can reference those DALI routes. So what's going to happen now is if we go to localhost 8080 forward slash V1 forward slash API forward slash V1 forward slash DALI, we can see cannot get, which is not good, but no worries. Usually the case is that we just have to reload our terminal. So if you terminate it and then restart it one more time, and then reload on the API v1 DALI, you should be able to see your DALI routes. So that's great. That means that we are now in here and we're properly reading it. But we don't want to simply send a message saying, hey, everything is good from our routes. We want to configure the use of the DALI API. So for that reason, right here below the router, we can create something known as a configuration. So const config is equal to new configuration. And then in here, we have to pass the API key. Now the question is, how do we get one? Well, you have to go to platform.openai.com forward slash account forward slash API keys. And there you will have to sign up or log in. I already have an account. So I'm going to simply log in. And once you do, you can create a new secret key. 
as you can see, I already have a couple. So you simply need to create a new key, copy it, and then to keep it secure, we're gonna paste it inside of a new .env file. Make sure it is within your server directory. We can call it open AI underscore API underscore key is equal to, and then you paste your key right there. So inside of here, inside of the DALI routes, the only thing you have to do is say process .env .openai underscore API underscore key. And that's going to connect the two. Now, the only thing you have to do is utilize this config and merge it with your instance of the OpenAI API by saying new OpenAI API, pass the config into it, and you'll be able to call its API to generate images for you. Isn't that great? Now, of course, we have to create a new route through which we'll be able to pass the prompt from the front end to the server. So we can say router that route, it's going to be a forward slash route, but this time it's going to be a dot post route. So we can actually pass the data through it. It's going to contain an async callback rec res function. And then in there, we can open a new try and catch block. In the catch, we can simply do something like console.error and then pass the error, as well as send a res that status of 500 with a message something went wrong. Inside of the try, we can actually get the prompt that we're passing from the front end. So we can say prompt, which is gonna be coming through rec that body. So how do we get an AI response? Well, we say const response is equal to await openai.create image. As you can see, that's a special function that allows you to create an image based on a given prompt. You have to call it and then pass in an object as the first and only param. To it, you can pass the actual prompt that we're getting from the front end. The n is equal to one, that's the number of images to generate. The size, in this case, it's going to be 1024 by 124, that's fine for us. And then the response underscore format, in this case, it can be a B64, meaning a base 64 underscore JSON, just the format in which we're gonna receive our image. Now, once we get a response, we can get that image out of it by saying const image is equal to response dot data dot data zero, and then dot B64 underscore JSON. And once we have it, we can simply pass it over to our front end by saying rest that status of 200.json. And then we pass the photo equal to this image. And that is it. So we have the DALI route completed. That DALI route is connected right here. And our server is up and running. So now that our server is done, we can keep it running. As you can see, it is currently running. We can reload it just for one good measure to ensure that our new routes are there. But this time we can click this plus button to open up a new terminal. And we're gonna open it so we can run our client side one more time. So we can send the prompt from the front end to the back end, which is then going to talk to the OpenAI API, and then it's going to return us the final image. So to do that, let's CD into client and let's run npm run dev. That's going to respin our local development server on the same port. There we go. And don't forget where we were. We were in the customize it and then this AI picker. So now we need to go back to the client side, source, components, and then AI picker. This is where the magic will happen. At least when it comes to the front end, because the back end magic has already been done or will be done by DALI, which we just hooked up to our back end. The AI picker itself is not going to be anything more than a simple form and two buttons that then calls our back end. So implementing it is going to be pretty straightforward. We can just import our custom button coming from 
that slash custom button. We can get all of the props that we passed into it, such as the prompt, set prompt, generating IMG, and handle submit. It's going to be wrapped in a div that's going to have a class name equal to AI picker dash container. And within it, we're going to have a text area. So it's not going to be an input because you can type a bit more stuff in. That text area is going to have a class name equal to AI picker dash text area. If we save it, immediately you can see that we can start typing text in here. Let's also give it a placeholder. We can do something like ask AI. Let's give it a rows equal to five. I think that should be enough. Value equal to prompt. And then on change equal to E, a callback function where we have the event and then set prompt E dot target dot value. Great. If we save that, you can see we have the placeholder ask AI. And now below that text area, we want to create a div with two buttons. So that's going to be a div that's going to have a class name equal to flex, flex dash wrap and gap dash three. Inside of there, we want to know, are we currently loading? So are we generating an image? If we are, in that case, we only want to show one button. So one custom button that's going to have a type equal to outline, a title equal to asking AI, and then it's going to have a custom styles equal to text dash XS. So you can think of this as a loading button. But then if we are not currently loading, we want to show a react fragment with two different buttons. It's again going to be a custom button, one for the type outline, where the title is going to be equal to AI logo. The handle click is going to be equal to a call to the handle submit function with the type equal to logo. And then finally, the last property is going to be custom styles where the text is going to be extra small. We can duplicate this button below, change it to filled instead of outline. And instead of AI logo, we can say AI full and change the submit to full. So one is for generating the logo and one is for generating the full image. And with that, our actual AI picker is done. So we can go back to our customizer component and we can ensure we do the right call to our newly created backend now that we have the buttons. So to do that, we first have to set generating IMG to be set to true, meaning we want to start the loading. And then we want to get the response by saying const response is equal to await fetch. That's going to be backend URL. So we're trying to fetch from the backend URL. And this is coming from our config, if I'm not mistaken. Let's look into it. Await fetch. And for now, this is going to be localhost 8080. And I think that's going to be it. Yeah, we want to make a call to 8080, but then API v1 and then DALI, if I'm not mistaken. Let's see, just to be sure. It's API v1 DALI, but it has to be a post request because we have to pass some data into it. So as the second parameter, we're going to pass in an object with options, such as a method equal to post, headers equal to content type application JSON, and then the body is going to be equal to JSON.stringify where we pass the prompt and we finalize it. So once again, let's look into this. We have a request that we're making to localhost 8080 API v1 DALI. And that's a post request of a type JSON passing over the prompt. Keep in mind that is calling the server that we created this specific route, the post route, that then generates the image from the DALI API and then returns it as photo. So once we have the request or the response, we can now say const data is equal to await 
response.json and we can call the handle decals function where we pass the type. Do we want to update the logo or do we want to update the texture? And then we need to pass the actual photo. That's going to be data image forward slash PNG semicolon base 64 comma and then data dot photo. That's how we can actually render that base 64 string. Great. And if we save it, that should more or less be it. Let's give it a shot. So let's try to ask AI to generate. Let's try with something interesting first. Let's try with something like design a simple and modern logo icon using geometric shapes and a minimalistic color scheme without any text or lettering. Let's try something like a cool, simple logo. If AI is really that smart, it should be able to generate it just based on that one single sentence. So in this case, it cannot because we get failed to fetch. So that's an error coming from the backend. And that's a response to this request we are making. It's coming here. So let's see if our backend is still running. It seems that it is. And if we open up the inspect element and go to console, we can see cannot load localhost 8080 API v1 DALI localhost is not supported. I think we need to add HTTP colon forward slash forward slash to be able to make that request. So now we can close this and we can try one more time, a cool, simple logo. And let's try it out. There we go. It says creating or asking AI and immediately the logo is there. Now, as you can see, this logo is interesting and simple, but yeah, we definitely need a bit more direction. So I recently asked ChatGPT to provide me a prompt for a logo, and that looks something like this. Design a simple modern logo icon using geometric shapes and a minimalistic color scheme without any text or lettering. So let's give that a shot. Maybe AI can tell another AI what to do better. Okay, this is definitely an interesting logo as well. Now, keep in mind that AI generated logos are not going to be good because they are not transparent. Even if we try to do something like design a simple transparent logo, I don't think it will be able to do that as it just creates an image and not a PNG. So there we go. You can see how that looks like, but Hey, you can always keep uploading your own images, but what AI is going to be exceptionally good at is generating gradients for the pattern of the entire shirt. So let's try asking it to design the entire pattern, create a gradient pattern that goes from blue to red, and we can do AI full. Now it's generating the full image background. And it looks like it breaks. If you can remember, we still didn't fix that problem where we're not showing the actual texture of the shirt. Before you go ahead and play with the API logo generation a bit, let's just fix that texture because it's going to be so much better when you can actually create your own texture of the shirt and the color of the shirt, and then implement your own logo that you want to upload to it in a PNG format. So let's collapse our terminal and let's look into why this button doesn't work. Or why is it not adding a full decal? So we can go to the state and the store. And here we can see is full texture at the start set to false. And if we manually set it to true, it actually applies a decal over the entire shirt. So maybe whenever we're changing the is full texture, maybe we're not changing it properly. So let's see where we're doing that. We're doing that in the shirt itself where we take the snap is full texture, and then we apply the full texture over it. That's just where we're applying it. But where are we actually setting it? We're doing that here. If we have the stylish shirt, and I can notice that I forgot to add a break here. Whenever you don't have a return statement in your switch, you absolutely need to add a break. So now if we bring this back, go back to customize it. And you know what, let's expand it to be able to see it in its full glory. We should now be able to generate that gradient using AI because now full texture should be working. 
And there we go. This is a great looking gradient. Now we can hide and show the logo and we can hide and show the texture as well, or we can mix and match the two. This is great. Let's try to play with the AI a bit more on creating some other textures. This one was also generated for me by ChatGPT. It says, create a smooth gradient pattern texture in shades of orange, blue, and green that can be used for a t-shirt design. Let's give that a shot. Okay, that's looking pretty cool. Let's try a couple more options. Create a unique t-shirt texture that has a vintage and distressed look. The texture should be designed to cover the entire front. Okay, that is great. It looks so good that I feel like I can touch the shirt through my screen and I'm not over exaggerating here. Let's try a couple more options. Maybe we can create a tiger skin shirt pattern. So maybe some stripes. Let's see how that should look like. Okay, there we go. Not bad, not bad at all. We can also try to do one for the logo. Maybe create a unique style icon or logo that represents a technology company. Futuristic and high tech. Let's see if we can do that. Okay, that's cool, but definitely doesn't look good on the uh, tiger pattern. So maybe a bit white on black looks a bit better. Great. Overall, as you can see, AI can now add real logos or we can upload the logos ourselves that immediately get attached here. We can then add AI patterns on top of the logos that we have added. So now we can have this crazy JS Mastery tiger striped shirt. And we can also keep changing the colors and even go back to the homepage. This is looking great. And with that, the entire functionality of our application has been implemented. We can just do regular color of the shirt, which can be changed by the color picker. We can do AI image upload for the logo, as well as the full texture. And then we can do the AI prompts to add the logo or to generate great gradients and textures such as this one. So with that said, our application has now been fully developed with all of its great functionalities, the 3JS models, 3JS camera and 3JS lighting and shadows, and also AI DALI functionalities. Isn't that great? Now, if you've been watching JavaScript Mastery for quite some time, then you know what's coming. And if you're new, then definitely feel free to subscribe. So what's coming is going to be the deployment process of our entire application where I'm gonna show you how we're going to deploy this application to the internet. So prepare for that, as that is our next and final step. To deploy our great application, we first have to publish it on GitHub. So go to GitHub, click this plus on top right, and create a new repository. We can name it something like project underscore 3JS underscore AI and set it to public. After that, let's first add a new dot git ignore file and ignore the node underscore modules as well as the dot env files. We don't want to push those to GitHub. And now we can open up the terminal, create a new instance, ensure that we are in the root of our directory, not in the client or the server folders, run git init, git add dot, and then we can follow the steps. git commit dash m first commit, git branch dash m main, git remote add origin, and then git push u origin master. And as soon as you reload the browser, you'll be able to see your code appear right there. Now I did encounter some issues while deploying the server. So let me show you how we can mitigate them to start with you have to remove the package.lock.json. And then also in the package.json, instead of nodemon index, we need to say nodemon index.js. Finally, we can do git add, git commit. We can say something like fix deployment and then git push. With that said, we are ready to start deploying our backend and then our frontend to their respective platforms. Let's expand our browser. And first we can focus on the render.com. That's the tool we'll use to deploy our backend. Click get started for free, sign in or sign up. On top right, click new, 
and choose web service. Go back to your GitHub repository and copy the URL, ensure it is public, and then paste it right here below and click continue. Choose the service name, such as project underscore 3JS underscore AI. Choose the root directory, in our case server, and the start command to npm run start. Finally, choose free and click create web service. While it is being set up, you also need to add your environment variables. So go to environment, add environment variable, choose open AI key, and then copy the value from your .env, paste it here and click save changes. That's going to rerun the deployments. So you can see another deployment is going to start and we can wait a bit until it is successfully published. So let's give it a few minutes and we'll be right back. And there we go, the deployment is live. And if we look at the logs, we can see that the server has started, well, not on port 8080, but rather on our newly deployed URL. Now, just a quick note, the initial deployment didn't work for me because I chose the renders Frankfurt server, which was closest to my location. And apparently there seems to be some issues with that region. So I had to redeploy it using another region. And with that, if we now copy and visit this URL, you can see that we get hello from DALI, which means that our API is now published. Great. Now we can go back to our client, source, and then search for where we had localhost 8080. If you search for it, you can notice that we have it right here in the config, but we can also hard code it right here in the response. So simply replace the HTTPS localhost 8080 with your newly deployed backend URL. And with that, the frontend side of our application is ready to be deployed as well. So what we can do is open up the terminal, CD into the client side, and then run npm run build. This is going to generate an optimized production build of our React application. And there we go, the build has been created and we can find a new dist folder within the client folder. Now we can go back to Hostinger's great dashboard where we initially created an account and purchased the hosting and the domain name. We can expand it just a bit and you can go to their file manager. While it is opening, we can also right click the dist folder and reveal in file explorer or in finder if you're on Mac that's going to open a folder that looks like this. We can go back to Hostinger, enter the public HTML and delete the default PHP. Now we can enter the dist folder and simply drag and drop all of the files from there to our deployment server. This is going to take just a moment. We can go back to the dashboard and click the domain name that you chose. And there we go. In just a second, our application is deployed and live on the internet. We can close all of the currently open tabs and just keep the one tab running, which is our application on Hostinger's fast server. As you can see, we immediately have SSL certificate without having to do any extra work whatsoever. And we are ready to continue customizing our application right here on the internet. Now, of course, we can keep uploading some different files, and that works as you can imagine. And let's give AI a shot too. Let's do give me a red to green gradient. And let's do a full. There we go. That's working as well. It looks like a sports jersey, which means that we are good to go. The entire application is now live, deployed to the internet. You'll learn 3JS as well as how to implement the DALI AI. Great work and thank you so much for coming to the end of this video. Huge thanks to Hostinger for making this video happen and even more thanks to you for improving your web development knowledge and investing in yourself. Now with this video, you invested two hours of your time and you managed to learn 3JS and AI integration. If you're happy with what you learned today, Imagine what you can learn with the JS Mastery Pro platform.
Here, we have a couple of great courses such as Filmpire and NFT Marketplace, but we also have our flagship bootcamp program, the JSM Masterclass Experience. If you want to get personalized mentoring from senior developers, myself included, you can get that right here. The link is going to be down in the description, so apply while you can. And let's not forget, if you want to get some official JS Mastery merch, comment down below and we'll make it happen. With that said, that's going to be it for today and I'll see you in the next one. Have a wonderful day.